As Maria has perfectly explained, adopting digital fluency is one of the main challenges of the near future, and universities are also facing this challenge. Students and teachers are doing everything to find the right balance between safety measures and learning management. Max and hand sanitizer are not only mandatory, but also part of the life on campus. With all this uncertainty and chaos, universities have to endure the digital transformation process. Thankfully, universities are resilient institutions. How many dangers have they faced throughout history? And here they are, after all. The coronavirus crisis is seen as a threat, but also as a booster for research and innovation. Only time will tell. Well, time and our next panel. But before we greet the speakers, let's welcome Cristina Manzano, director of S Global and columnist at El País. Welcome, Cristina. Thank you very much, uh, Marta. Good afternoon, good morning, if you are on the other side of the Atlantic, good evening. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, there, at the other side of, of the screen, uh, for this uh, exceptional panel to tell us, Marta just explained, um, the challenges and opportunities for the future of higher education, especially here in Europe. Uh, we have with us today, uh, for this, to, to talk about these issues, we have uh, Santiago Iniguez, who's president of I University. We have Martin Paul, who's the rector of the University of Maastricht. We had Edel Traub, Heiniger Egger, Han Harapi Egger, sorry, um, a, who's the rector of the University of Vienna Sciences and uh, Business um, there in, in Austria. And we have Andrea Principe, who's the rector of Luis Guido Cali Uni University in Rome. Um, Marta explained very well all the uh, different aspects of these uh, challenges and opportunities, but I want to start from the very beginning. The first impact that uh, the pandemic has had on, on higher education, on ed education in general, is that it has become totally virtual. And I wanted to start with Edel Trapp. I wanted to ask you, um, do you think is, this is a permanent uh, trend? Are we seeing now students going back to classes normally? Do you think it will stay forever? What, what is your opinion? Oh, well, thank you very much. No, well, of course, we, we saw that it works to go on, to go virtual and to have uh, all our lectures uh, transformed to the digital format. So it, it did work, actually. But nevertheless, we can see that our students and even also our faculty members, they are a little bit exhausted from all those different online uh, formats, online meetings. And now, since we started to invite them at least partially again back to campus, I can really see how happy they are to meet again, to have a kind of a social interaction, to get the feeling, to get the spirit of the university and the campus life, even with uh, those regulations we have because of safety reasons. So since they are aware of the fact that they really missed a lot this uh, direct meeting and face-to-face -face meeting and debating, I don't think that we can on the long term actually exclude and finally substitute all those interactions by digital formats. One of the, one of the main pillars of this new trend is the, the role of technology, of course. And we are hearing much and more and more about uh, what it's called hybrid education, because as you well mentioned, many students want to go back to the classrooms, but suddenly we have the virus again. I wanted to ask Santiago how um, I is facing this trend towards combining face-to-face -face and, and online education. Well, we have been working for the past uh, 20 years in hybrid formats, and thus we were able to jump when the pandemic was declared. We had here in Spain a state of alarm. So we were able to jump into hybrid formats uh, on the spot without any sort of solution of continuity. But I agree very much with uh, what the rector of Vienna University was saying before. Education is an embodied activity. We learn when we are small children, we start learning not just by listening and uh, seeing things, but even by touching. So the senses and the use of the senses uh, is vital for uh, the learning process. That's why we have discovered that despite technology bridges uh, the learning process, and of course helps a lot in terms of personalizing the learning, we still need very much face-to-face -face in presence education. In fact, all the surveys that have been run uh, across uh, uh, continents for uh, undergraduate and uh, postgraduate students reveal 
that they all miss being on campus and interacting in presence with their fellow students? Um, many of those fellow students come from other countries and uh, international, international mobility has also been very much affected. Uh, Martin, um, again, do you think that this pandemic will change the way we have been perceiving, we, we have been living international mobility not only the pandemic, but also other trends like the new transatlantic relations or Brexit. Many uh, students used to go, we used to prefer uh, the UK for their studies. Are they changing now more? Are they looking more towards continental Europe? Yes, I think so. There, there is a change that we see and I think it will last. Uh, I think the challenge now is how can we uh, create uh, international mobility in a virtual context? As you may know, I'm also responsible for uh, European uh, University Alliance, you for young universities for the future of Europe. And we have spent uh, a lot of efforts recently to have uh, a virtual uh, uh, mobility, which means that uh, students can uh, follow courses online at 10 different uh, European universities. So uh, that is not a perfect replacement of going and experience a different culture, but you certainly also can uh, follow what we call an international classroom. Then beyond Europe, uh, I think the, the change will be more uh, dramatic uh, as any geopolitical change uh, has been in the past, such as Brexit, the situation in the US that's unclear, uh, situation in Asia. So I think that will change the students' dreams. I can only say from my university, we were surprised that we see 15% more students that uh, inscribed at my university this year. Uh, mostly from within Europe, not from outside Europe. There we see a, a small decrease. Andrea, may, may I ask you, are you also seeing that trend? More students coming from within Europe than from other places that used to come before? Yes, we've experienced the same pattern that Martin was, was uh, mentioning. Um, although, against all odds, we did receive uh, a very large number of applications from uh, international students. As a matter of fact, we we doubled, we uh, more than doubled the number of applications. So this means that uh, there is, I think, a need which is now an ingrained in the students' DNA and student minds um, that uh, international mobility is part and parcel of uh, the educational path. So although probably in the short term, we will experience a reduction in the, of, of mobility of students, uh, which can be somehow substitute, substituted with uh, what Martin was saying, using digital technologies in the medium to short to, to, to the long term, um, we do we do expect and do expect that uh, we are going to uh, still rely upon uh, uh, international mobility as again as an important dimension of of uh, students' career paths. Let me touch now upon the economic factor because the economic, the economic crisis is one of the most uh, known uh, effects of, of consequence of this uh, pandemic. And I would like to ask you about both the impact for um, higher education institutions and for the students themselves. Let's start with the, with the institutions. Edeltraub, um, how can um, universities face the decrease in, in tuition fees if students are not going back in, in as large numbers as before, for instance, or how, are universi how can universities face the um, development, the research needed, the, the investment in technology needed to face this virtual future? Um, do we have enough resources to be up to the, to the level of the challenge? Well, I think this is a, a, a kind of a political question. You know, I'm a rector of a public university, which means that I am not relying on tuition fees because our understanding is that education is a public good, which is then uh, funded by, a pub, by public money, by taxpayers' money. Um, if you have an idea of, you know, that um, education is an investment in, in your own human capital, then, of course, it's more an idea of um, private good where, where you have to, invest in your own market value and then of course you are more on the side of tuition fees what i can see now compared to my colleagues from those institutions who really rely on tuition fees that they face severe financial problems on the long-term run as well 
Um, so I'm a little bit lucky. I'm a little the lucky guy, I guess. So um, I can see that even we have always the discussion on depending on political um, situations by being a public university. At the moment, this saves us from financial damages. However, what we will see is that probably more and more students can't afford uh, an education because it's not only about tuition fees, of course, it's only about, you know, not contributing to family income or also do, you know, do have to work for their own um, economic, for own economic reasons. Therefore, I think that one idea would be to go a little bit more to um, philanthropic culture, which is not very well developed in Europe. But basically, I think we should invest a little more in this area of um, um, uh, the idea that people just support financially uh, research and universities and therefore higher education. You are totally right. Even if you don't depend on, on tuition fees, um, the challenge is also for public finances when I, they are and they are going to be much more stressed due, due, due to the crisis. Um, Martin, do you think the plans that the European Commission, the European institutions are um, designing for the recovery plan and the, and the next uh, budget for the European Union, do you think that will be enough to cover that, that stress in, in our public finances well, regarding, again, higher education? I mean, that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, uh, I'm concerned that uh, if the European uh, Commission uh, makes budget cuts that... Uh, uh, higher education is usually can be uh, a, uh, a victim. So I think we have to lobby for that. Uh, but on the, on the positive side, there's also a lot of investment now. I was more concerned, I would say, if you asked me this question four to six weeks ago, but I see in, in, in many countries, also in my country, it's the willingness uh, to, to just invest to conquer the crisis. And I think that's what we also need at universities. But I, I, uh, I would agree with my colleague from Vienna, the, in my country, also, the universities are financially, at the moment, financially stable. The, the, what we have to worry about is the students. The economical situation is the students, the family where they come from, will they still be able to afford to go to university? So that, that will be the challenge for the future. But in, in terms of, of my national funding, I am very optimistic in Europe. I hope we can uh, convince uh, Europe that investing in higher education in the higher education area is still an essential uh, feature. But I'm really worried about uh, the students and their families. Andrea, regarding precisely students, um, what, what is your um, exper experience there in Rome? Um, are students dropping out because of economic problems? Um, are there enough uh, uh, financial support for, for them? Um, are they changing? Is, is a university college degree still um, the door to the social uh, the, 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 the ladder, the social ladder to, to step to another uh, way of, of being in life? Is, is this still something that most people want to have now? Well, I do think, and of course I'm, I'm, I'm biased in this respect, being uh, the leader of the uh, of a university, although it's, it's, it's a private university, I do think that uh, uh, students and in general uh, university education, academic education, still represents the way to to um, prepare the, the next generation of, of leaders and therefore offer opportunities also to, uh, to students that cannot afford. On the um, as a university, we have not experienced any 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 uh, drops, any number drops for. For students, but we we did have we do have uh, uh, offered to to students, even students already enrolled at Lewis, um, uh, grants to support them because of the economic crisis, uh, which has not been particularly uh, important as yet. But I do think that will kin will kick in later on. So I think we should we should be aware of this, and I think we should also try to think about different other solutions. For instance, we have uh, liars with. Um, with a few uh, banks to offer um, loans. At the same time, we also ally us with, with companies to increase the number of grants and scholarship to, to students. Thank you. Um, Thank you. One of, again, one of the major things that we are seeing that, uh, the, 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 that the pandemic has created is to increase the gap 
um, the inequality gap in many aspects, but also in education. Um, we have heard many stories of children in their homes which didn't have good internet access, for instance, which didn't have the equipment, the, the computers and so on. At the university level, Santiago, um, how can universities keep being, uh, keep assuring that that gap is not widening in the coming years? What, uh, what is your experience from IE? Well, sure. I mean, this is one of the major issues that we all talk about uh, these days, accessibility to higher education on a universal basis. And linking, you know, your question to previous comments, because education is a common good, which is provided by both uh, public as well as private universities, but it's a costly activity. And what we find is that uh, uh, states and governments are dropping their investments in education across the board. This is happening in the US as elsewhere. Uh, we are also finding uh, that uh, uh, there's some resistance to pay high tuition costs so we need to uh, gather uh, the support of many different agents from public and private sources, uh, including, of course, fundraising activities in order to finance uh, our uh, different activities and provide universal access to applicants and students. So I guess uh, this is actually an issue which is uh, applicable across the board. It doesn't just affect uh, European uh, uh, countries. It's also uh, present in the US, across the Americas, and increasingly in Asia. Of course, education can become an equalizer. It can actually provide uh, the best possible access to climb up, as you were saying before, the social ladder. But unless you guarantee access uh, to higher education, good scholarships, good loan schemes, and of course, uh, many other sources in order to finance the activity at universities. And this is also linked to international mobility. Uh, uh, of course, moving all those students and faculty members and talent across uh, uh, countries, cross border, does also entail uh, costs. And uh, the European Union has been you know, very supportive of the Erasmus program, but we will probably need to increase those funds in the future. So, Anyway, education is a common good that deserves lots of attention in order to gather enough funds to, uh, to, 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 to finance, you know, this very important activity for the global society. Uh, let me go back to the very beginning, because we were talking about the impact of uh, the pandemic in virtual teaching, how everyone has become suddenly uh, virtual. But do, you, do students and do parents consider that virtual teaching has the same level? Um, than face-to-face uh, -face teaching and learning, of course. And what about the, the experience on, on campus? When we have to become, uh, Edel Trapp was saying before, that many students want to go back. We are seeing students going back to campus, but there will be moments where it won't be possible. There will be institutions that will bet on, on virtual because of many reasons. Um, how can we define a university college uh, degree that, uh, that is virtual without having the, the, uh, the experience of the campus life experience, which was an essential, it is an, an essential part of uh, higher education. Um, I know you mentioned before that most of, of the students want to come back to the campus, but what if, uh, as, and as I was asking at the very beginning, is this a permanent trend? Is this a temporary uh, issue? What is your opinion, Martin? Yes, I think the, the full-time virtual education is a temporary solution and temporary response to the acute phase of the pandemic. Then if there is a lockdown, you have to go this way. If you can avoid that, I think the future is indeed the blended classroom hybrid education. We have done a lot of interviews with staff and students, current ones and ones that apply, that they really want this mix. They want a mix of a campus experience with an online uh, variant. So what we have decided to do here, and we have currently run our campus with 20, 30% of the normal uh, capacity due to the social distancing rules, that all the lectures are online. All, uh, I would say, large, uh, larger groups are online. But uh, the small groups, uh, the interaction, the social interactions, we organize those on campus. In my view, this is the, the, the model that we also will pursue in the future. I don't think uh, a full-time uh, digital virtual environment 
for the whole degree program is going to be viable to replace what we have done in the past. And what about teaching? What about professors? How have they um, got used to this online teaching? Because students are young and by definition more resilient. But what about the faculty? And uh, this is a common question. This goes for all of you. What, what has been your experience throughout these months with all these professors having to teach online if they were not used to? Um, who goes first? Maybe Edeltrop, please. <laughs> Well, yes, um, indeed, I, I, I had um, nice um, experiences with co colleagues who would probably have said uh, one year ago that there's no way to have any digital format in the class because this is just not thinkable. Now, they would come back to me and would say, well, now, since I had to go uh, online, I learned a lot and I can see that there are still parts I can also in a long term run, I could, um, you know, use for a better uh, uh, teaching concept. So I think that my faculty members did a good, did a good job. But nevertheless, what we saw is that they really need competences. It's not only about um, technological competences and how to use the tools, but it's also that they really had to redesign their concepts. So simply, you know, switching your uh, traditional teaching concept uh, into the virtual world, this did not work. But in order, you know, to have a high quality teaching um, a performance, we really had to offer coaching, we had to offer workshops, we had to offer a different kind of further training of uh, community learning, learning from each other and so on. So I think that um, also teachers and, and, and faculty members, they experienced new ways of teaching and uh, new ways of um, yeah, interacting with the students. However, what they also reported is that they really miss um, uh, the interaction with the students. And may I add just one issue about the virtual world. What we can see is that it is much easier to, uh, to switch to online formats in groups of students who know each other. So they have already some networks and they know each other. They had been in classes last uh, academic year and so on. For those who come to the campus for the very, very first time, who have to, um, you know, to get used to this huge uh, organization, to, uh, to find new friends, to find learning groups, these are um, those who really need also on-site um, uh, events and, 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 and space to get to know each other. Andrea, how, has, how has, uh, have you uh, dealt with this, with your professors, the professors in, in, in the Louis Guido uh, University? How have they dealt with uh, teaching online? Were they used to? Uh, how, how far had you gone before uh, this pandemic to online teaching? Well, I'm smiling because uh, I, I like to say that we, uh, with, due to the pandemics and due to the lockdown, each of us has had to, was somehow forced to, uh, to attend a crash course into the future. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you know, uh, all our faculty at Lewis, some of them were already very much into digital learning, uh, but now the entire faculty has experienced, has had a very interesting experience now to use uh, digital technologies. And I think that uh, that uh, uh, despite you know the 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 kind of uh, gap that we had at the beginning, that we have uh, we have filled it very well uh, to the extent that uh, uh, soon after the, the the end of the of the summer term last last academic year, we have organised a set of uh, of seminars for our faculty to tell them how to and teach them how to redesign the programs, the courses. Uh, to ex better exploit this hybrid model, as other universities in Europe, as we were, we were listening um, at Lewis, we have embraced, we have uh, adopted the this this hybrid model that uh, um, offer more, in fact, more spaces, more logistics, more on-campus presence for the uh, for the freshers, for the students of the first years, and uh, overall for the other students, it's a 50-50 online vis-a-vis. Uh, in presence, in presence uh, classes. Because one thing, another thing that we've learned during the the lockdown is that uh, um, uh, online teaching has great opportunities, and I do think that we need to uh, to take online teaching and digital technologies into account when we're going to be redesigning further on the programs and the courses. But we shouldn't forget that learning 
is a is a social process, and and in fact, it's also a socializing process. So we do we do need to have in presence uh, uh, lecture, in presence interaction, in order to make sure that learning does take place and can be augmented by digital technologies. So it cannot be substituted for it, but can be actually can be can can be augmented by digital technologies. Santiago, I has been a pioneer in online teaching. Uh, it has been there for 20 years. Where do you see the next wave of innovation in, in higher education and uh, in higher education in general? Well, if I if I can link, you know, the, your question with these uh, the need of uh, having our faculties adapted to this new environment, because many of the consequences of uh, of the COVID are here to stay in terms of how technology has become much more embedded in the learning process. So I guess that the major contribution of technology in the future will be the personalization of learning. Technology provides the opportunity to identify and potentiate all the skills from uh, participants, from students. And if we prepare our professors, our faculty, in order to orchestrate this process in the best possible way, we can actually enhance the whole learning process. So this is actually what we are seeing now at IE University. Of course, it's, it's very challenging because uh, running hybrid formats demand from professors that they uh, manage the platform and at the same time have an eye on those students who are attending in presence, but also take care of those who are attending on remote and at the same time manage, you know, the, the blackboard, the digital blackboard. So it's quite stressful. Already teaching, you know, is stressful. If you add all those elements, it can be actually a very demanding task. So what is vital is that we actually train our faculty so that they can not just cope with the new challenges, but can make from these uh, lots of opportunities the best possible experience, learning experience for participants. I guess that the major contribution of all this is the personalization of the learning process. Let me turn the same question to Martin, please. Uh, what is your experience with, with the faculty? How have they reacted? And where do you see the next wave of innovation in, in higher education? Yeah, well, I think I was, uh, we were all impressed, of course. We are a problem-based uh, learning uh, university. I would say we are, we are very versed to deal with problems. Uh, we have adapted very fast. And we also had teams of more experienced users that taught the others. So that was not the issue. The thing that concerns us, and this has also been uh, addressed by Santiago, the, 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 the pressure, the additional work pressure that this online teaching can cause. So we have really to invest in additional help, new technology, faster internet uh, connections, also uh, uh, yeah, emotional support. And then another point, a lot of our faculty is in home office provide equipment for them that they can use in home to make the home office as efficient than their own faculty. The future, in my view, is that we have to develop this virtual aspect even more and uh, also add new technology. And then we are, can, can easily ask our students who are in a generation that extremely creative. So we have experimented with new virtual formats such as in the teaching process, such as uh, hackathons to address certain issues that the students uh, really love to do, or also gaming uh, strategies to integrate in the process. What we have to do is move away from the idea of uh, digital or virtual uh, education uh, in, the, in, the, in the sense we're doing it now, sitting across each other on, on a flat screen, to really uh, find uh, the creativity that a lot of these young people have and integrate it into the, uh, the virtual aspect of our hybrid education uh, system of the future. Let me be a bit of a devil advocate here. Um, talking about Europe, uh, our, where do you see the competition? Um, especially considering that we are relying, completely relying on, on technology companies and te technology corporations. The European Union is trying to, to fill the gap with not having uh, technological champions, which are necessary to develop all these, all these uh, 
factors in, in higher education. Where do you see the competition? In technology, in other countries? Is it in Asia? Is it in the United States still? Um, can we really be up to the level of the, of the moment, of not now, of the future that is coming to us? Who wants to go first? Maybe Andrea, please. Well, that is, a, as we're saying, a kind of political question here. The, I don't think that Europe does have the, the potential to, to cope with the, with the competition in, in higher education, but in general across, across industry, uh, to, to uh, sort of give a kind of uh, more academic uh, um, answer to the, to the question. I would say that it depends very much on us. It depends very much on how we're going to be allocating the uh, the funds that the European Union is allocating to the different different countries, and, down, and then it's down to the countries to make sure that uh, investments are being made in infrastructure overall, but also digital infrastructure and you know human infrastructure. So again, higher education here, of course, I, I do underline all my bias. Um, human capital education is is fundamental to for uh, the future of Europe. You know, if we want again to to exploit all our potential to, to be at the forefront of technology, industry in general, and higher education. Precisely, because it's not only infrastructure or technology, it's also the e-skills, the, the skills that people will need to face that future. Uh, Edel Trapp, what, again, what is your view on this? Well, I... Uh... I agree to Andrea that it depends a little bit on uh, the political situation in Europe and the willingness to invest further into higher education. But I think there is one, one big strength uh, of Europe, namely I would call it a kind of uh, innovative capacity to the diversity we have. So given this European complex, uh, which is, you know, historically seen very much um, um, oriented towards enlightenment and those values, I think there is a real strength we could put forward and we could try to figure some, you know, to, to elaborate some niches and to come up with a very strong um, 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 innovation network um, uh, among different stakeholders and to build up an innovation ecosystem, a European ecosystem. And there, of course, we could try to um, have good partners, different stakeholders, and so on and so on. Of course, we are in a global competition. So it's not, I mean, it would be naive to say, well, we we can think about, you know, a very local uh, uh, situation. We are competing all the time. We always have been competing with the rest of the world. But nevertheless, I think there is a chance uh, of a specific European model of higher education, of education, and of a value-driven um, solidarity, society of solidarity based on um, education and I would call this an informed participation or democratic systems. So yes, I think uh, we, we are competing, but there is a um, very good opportunity to come up with a European model of higher education and a self-understanding of what it means to be part of an innovative ecosystem. Martin, what would be for you that uh, definition for a European model of higher education? Well, I think, uh, let me come just shortly back to the technology question. I think technology is not uh, deciding the race. It is uh, deciding the race what's our value proposition. And indeed, and I say the modern university is a uh, European invention. So I think we should build the future on our tradition, yeah. number one. Number two, uh, the European uh, University Alliance idea is a very good one. Uh, we need indeed, uh, we all come from countries uh, relatively small, somewhat bigger. If you put us on the map next to China or the US or in Canada, we are all small. But if we can pull this together, if we come with a strong value proposition of an or European landscape, then I think we're going to be very competitive. It's not, it's more easily said than done. What we have to do in this context is overcome some of the still existing inequalities in the European higher education area. New member states, traditional universities, young universities as the university that I am chairing need to come together to do this. If we, if we are smart to pull our resources together, then we have a real chance to have a very unique proposal that is different from countries where free speech has less value than uh, here, 
that is different from countries where you uh, are under extreme pressure or uh, get easily rejected to get a visa, like we see now in, in some of our traditional partners in the US, then we can be very strong in this competition. Santiago? Mm. No, if I, if following on, on the previous comments, no, if I look at uh, how the response from European universities has been uh, in, in face of this crisis, the pandemics, I guess that overall it has been much more proactive and quick than uh, the reaction on the side of American universities, uh, which uh, in, in many cases they just entered into a state of shock. I guess that uh, our universities have been more prompt quick, we have opened the campuses, we have installed the necessary health protocols, we have been in contact with the different stakeholders. So in my impression, I guess that uh, we are probably closer to our students, uh, to our customers and to the rest of the stakeholders. But following on Sabine's comments, I guess that uh, Europe provides a much more diverse environment, which can be attractive to many international students. Uh, competition is becoming more multipolar like happens in many other sectors of social activity. And we, we will see in the future, of course, many new uh, Chinese large universities competing to attract uh, talent. Uh, we saw in the past uh, English speaking countries from, of course, the US, UK and Australia. But we will also see uh, emerging countries also uh, fighting for their own stake in the market. So. The way we can actually provide uh, a, an attractive offer for international applicants is by enhancing what is the best of Europe, our diversity, our history and traditions, the way we combine the humanities with uh, this uh, professional orientation of our degrees, and of course, many other things, our closeness to stakeholders, for example. So I guess that uh, European universities have uh, a very good opportunity to seize whatever happens after this uh, COVID. Thank you. Uh, we are reaching the, the end of our um, panel, but I wanted to introduce a controversy recently uh, launched by, by Scott Galloway. Um, he states that, uh, or he thinks, that there will be partnerships between higher education, very, very elite uh, institutions like MIT and, and the like, and uh, the big tech companies, and that that will lead to um, a group and, and a very limited sort of, of um, institutions addressed to a very small elite and the rest will be virtual and will be just left aside. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think about this? Because yes, we are seeing the, these partnerships between the technological uh, companies and the universities, but is the future that this topic? Martin, I see you nodding. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, this is this is very interesting. I think the uh, and I would would uh, 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 yeah maybe some people do that and maybe there's going to be a group. But I think looking back at our European tradition, our strengths and our future must be that we are non-elitist. You know, the the program of our alliance is we want to be excellent. We want to be not elitist. We want to be inclusive. If I look at the societal uproar that I see in many countries, in France with, with, the, with the yellow jackets, in the US, in others, it's always about inequality. It's always about being the elite. I think that universities need to reach out to society more than we have done, and we do this in Europe better than in many other countries. So, of course, there may be some MIT working together with some tech guys, fine, and they may maybe cater to some uh, elite group or so-called elite group of students, but this is not going to resolve the global problems that we have to face. I think in that aspect, you need broad universities that are providing excellent education. And most of all, next to this education, also provide a global citizenship training, academic responsibility to make sure that our graduates participate in the future of this continent and globally. Who else wants to, to comment on this idea, uh, Edel Trapp? 
Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with Martin. So I would say that, of course, this might be a trend and a tendency. So there is, uh, and of course, we, we, we can see that more and more big data science companies are offering cooperations to universities, in particular to offer infrastructure and any kind of, you know, data access and, 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 and resources they need. And this might be um, good cooperation, so partnerships and so on. But I don't think that this, um, I think there will be a revival of the European idea of higher education. And as, as Martin said, it's, uh, it's not, um, so we don't, we should not misunderstand that elite does not mean um, that we are not sticking to performance, that we're not sticking to high quality, uh, but we probably are more on the side of inclusion and diversity uh, considered as strength. And I, I'm pretty sure and completely convinced that this will on a long term pay off. Thank you very much. We've reached the end of, of our time. Uh, it's been really interesting, very, very insightful. And I want to thank you because with all these debates about challenges and opportunities, I want to leave it here with the opportunities. You have all transmitted a positive future. Uh, we have the chance. Um, the Erasmus programme was mentioned before, has been the, the major producers of uh, European citizens, of Europeanism. And uh, with the potential that our universities have, I'm sure we will get there. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for being there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.